I, those of you who are in, clinicians and particularly in therapists, I very much encourage you to stay to see two um, individuals at the end of their life from the John Hopkins research. It's really important. So across millions of life, uh, households in America, 1957, the Life magazine was delivered with a very good uh, mushroom, psilocybin mushroom field guide. <laughs> um, and, um, and this is something that's interesting to me. Here's um, Demeter giving um, Persephone a mushroom, présenté. This is how you give a sacrament. You don't go, here, take this. You go, pay attention. Look at me. This is what I'm giving you. Do you understand? This is important. That's a very, very common gesture that I've seen over and over again. Well, Maria Sabina did something similar, giving it to R. Gordon Wasson here. And then my brother John, you know, is giving me philosophy semilanciata. And I told him about this. Presente. You need to give it with respect. So um, anyhow, so... Um, my brother John was a very big and important person in my life. He went to uh, Yale on break. He went down to Mexico and Colombia. He had an extraordinary uh, interest in psychoactive substances. I got really excited because of him and um, started getting into mushrooms. And um, so John came back with this book. And John said, never show this photograph in public. <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, and he came back with a book by Charles Tart, which one of the speakers referred to yesterday about blew my mind. And, oh, my God, Charles Tart's up there again. And it's altered states of consciousness. I grew up in a small town in Ohio. Um, uh, my best friend, Ryan Snyder, he's my sidekick. We hang together all the time. I'm reading this book. Ryan's interested in what I'm interested in, so he wants to borrow the book. I said, listen, John's going back to Yale in two weeks. I have to give it back to him before he goes back to class. So give the book back to me. So Ryan borrowed the book, you know, and a few days later, Ryan, you know, John's going back. He's asking about, the, asking about the book. Please give it back to me. And Ryan's hesitating and hemming and hawing. And I say a few days later, and now John's really pressuring me. And I'm going, you know, Ryan, where's my friggin' book? My brother's friggin' book. And Ryan sheepishly looked at me and said, Paul, I can't give it back to you. And I said, why? And he says, my dad discovered it and burned it. I said, your dad burned my brother's book? <laughs> I was shocked. And I was terrified to tell my old or brother. And I told him he was not happy. And it, he was really unhappy with me. And I thought, you know, I'm going to make this into something good. If this book and its subject was so disturbing to Ryan Snyder's father, then I think I found a subject field of interest that I want to explore. <laughs> <laughs> so my John, you know, went to Yale, went to the University of Washington Neurophysiology uh, School. He became very well known as a photographer when that, he chose out of his career. So I was always trying to impress my brother, John. I'm the youngest kid in the family. And we grew up with a big laboratory in the basement, Columbia, in Ohio. And we had an intrepid uh, aircraft carrier radio, which my dad served on that aircraft carrier. We had that in the basement. So I listened to coded message. But John was a serious scientist. He had rose and rose of chemicals and whatnot. And so I, John was, I, I would take John and John and I tripped a lot together. So it was really great. A family that trips together stays together. Um, <laughs> it was a great bonding. Um, and, but, I, but John was always like, you know, being the alpha brother. You know, Paul, not good enough, not good enough. So I got vetted and awarded uh, by the AAAS, the American Academy of Advancement of Science, the British Science Magazine, as the first invention ambassador of, of AAAS. So the group of seven of us, including the founder of digital photography. And so I got this award. I mean, I had to go through a gauntlet of interviews and, and all this stuff. And they want messengers who can message science to the public who are inventors, who have patents, who are inventing things. So I got chosen. So I got my award letter. I was really excited. I got, damn it, brother, I can show you now. I got a, I got a word, you know, from AAAS. And so I was real excited. I called Mother John several times uh, on a Friday night, and he didn't answer, and he didn't answer. And that was the day he died. He, he never answered the phone. So... So because of John's encouragement and criticism and mentorship, you know, I've chosen this career. So other people who've influenced me a lot, Dr. Michael Bugue on the left, Alexander Smith uh, holding the big mushrooms there, then Kit Skates down below and Daniel Stunts. They all passed on. They were all what we call politically conservative, which is really extraordinary because I showed up at the Evergreen State College and started studying under Michael Bugue and then met these other giants in the field of mycology. This is what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> Your suspicions are now confirmed. <laughs> By the way, guys, I was the first guy to go through puberty in my high school, you know, from my age group. Anyhow, that's why I have so much hair when I'm 19 years of age. Um, so, anyhow, so that, uh, 
we got a Drug Enforcement Administration license, uh, Michael Bug did, um, and that umbrellaed us. And then a very strange, Jonathan Ott, Jeremy Bigwood, and myself all uh, went and studied under Michael Bug. And between the three of us, I think we have 14 or 15 books on psychoactive uh, plants and mushrooms between us. So really, really nerdy professor, fun, really great professor, love, love him still. Um, but he got the DEA license, and so Jeremy and I, the guy in the middle, and myself, we were umbrella with a drug enforcement administration license, and we, I thought everybody was a DEA agent. So I'm a solitary kind of guy anyhow, but anyone came up to me, I thought, yeah, you're an agent. I can tell, you know. And so I got tempted and bribed all these sorts of times, and it always turned everybody down, so I never got in trouble. But it's really extraordinary. And then at the same time, uh, Terrence McKenna, uh, Gary Menzer, Stephen Pollock, and Andy Weil. This is all in the 1970s. Um, those of you who are interested, please pick up Harper's Magazine and uh, read the story on Stephen Pollock. He was a physician in San Antonio, Texas. I was speaking to him on the phone uh, when he, he was murdered with a 357 Magnum. Um, horrible story. I uh, called up several times later. The police answered the phone. The uh, policeman who answered the phone was the killer and uh, knew Steve had a lot of money. And so I said, crazy story. You have to read it to believe it. Um, and then we did a series of psychoactive mushroom conferences through the late 70s, you know, into 2000. And I knew the Mary Pranksters and I knew the psychedelic scientists. So I thought, why don't we bring them all together? <laughs> so I knew both communities. And so we did the 1999 Brighton Bush Millennial Mushroom Conference. And there's Andy Weil there, Sasha Shulgin, you know, a lot of uh, top psychonauts, you know, Christian Wretch and a whole bunch of other, David Aurora, a whole, whole bunch of uh, people. We had 45 speakers and 60 paying participants. So it was, I lost $50,000. I don't lose it. It was the best investment I ever made because I got all these people together. Then the psychoactivity conferences, you know, in, in Europe occurred. Um, and there's Sasha Shulgin there for those people. How many people here knew who Sasha Shulgin was? You know, created hundreds of new psychoactive molecules. Um, anyhow, a number of books then came out. And uh, it's just uh, four, uh, five of my books there. But I love the book, The Golden Guide to Hallucinating Plants. What every third grader needs to learn, you know. <laughs> you got minerals, you got birds, you know, you got fish, and you got psychoactive plants. Um, this is because the, the, a hippie inherited the Golden Guide fortune totally into psychedelics. He commissioned this. And, uh, of course, the PTAs and everybody across the country up in arms. So it was a one-print edition. These are worth 500 bucks a piece now. So, so then... <laughs> the philosophy Cubensis Scholarship Fund is what I call it, uh, then permeated throughout the uh, universities and colleges all over the world, especially in California. Um, and uh, people grow psilocybin mushrooms in jars on grain. Um, and, you know, people didn't get rich from this. They paid their tuition. They bought groceries you know, put the money back into the community. Uh, but it was very much a very, very common practice. I went on to discover four new psilocybin active species, Psilocybe azurescens, Psilocybe metaformans, Psilocybe sonofibulosa, and one I named after uh, Dr. Andrew Weil. Now, to be very clear here, I've drawn a line in the sand. Nature provides, I don't. Okay? You know, the freedom of information protects books. It doesn't protect me from telling you how to grow psilocybe mushrooms verbally. Uh, so don't ask me for psilocybe mushrooms. Nature provides, I don't. But I have a passion for this. So I, this was in, in the vault. I pulled it out about two months ago. So this is kind of fun. Greetings and meet Psilocybe azurescens. Psilocybe azurescens is probably one of the most potent mushrooms in the world. It contains psilocybin and psilocin up to 2% of its dried mass. Now think of that. 2% of the dried mass of this mushroom are psychoactive crystals. Why would a mushroom produce so much? We don't know, but it certainly has attracted the interest of humans. The blueing that you see here is a bruising reaction. It's indicative of psilocin as it degrades. And the more bluing you see, the more psilocin there once was. Now, psilocybin dephosphorylates into psilocin, and when you ingest these mushrooms, psilocin becomes a serotonin agonist. It means that, that the psilocybin or the psilocin becomes a temporary neurotransmitter, opening up the floodgates of the senses. Now, this mushroom is sinuous. It's got a sinuous stem, which means it bends back and forth. It's bluing very, very strongly, and it has these uh, very... Um, indicative spore color here on the annular zone and the spore color is purple brown and the mushrooms are bluish those two features in combination 
pretty much de facto determines is is philosophy. Now look how bodacious the rhizomorphs are at the base of the stem. This is a large psilocybe, by far the largest one that I know that grows on wood chips in the Pacific Northwest. It is now a popular one to have in your backyard. Uh, it's just fun. It's just naturalized in the woods here. Um, and this is a beautiful fruiting of them. And the psilocybes, um, uh, 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 many of the woodland psilocybes have this uh, chestnut brown to caramel color. Uh, this one is unique in that it's got these umbos, and there it's a broad umbo, and the cap is very circular. The bruising reaction is just from impact of rain, perhaps. Um, this mushroom is one of the most fascinating and interesting ones to grow. Those who in, uh, choose to partake of this mushroom should be warned. These are exceptionally potent, and oftentimes they can cause... Uh, temporary paralysis, loss of muscle control. So that is not a good thing. It seems that most people who boil this mushroom in hot water, those symptoms seem to be alleviated. Uh, but this is a clearly a sacred species, and I love just personally touching it. This is not a mushroom that I, that I enjoy eating. Uh, it's almost too potent for me. And, um, but it is a species that I greatly admire. I love touching it. I love handling it. I love seeing it. And um, it's a great indicator of the habitat in my magical mushroom forest that is uh, very conducive to spiritual experiences. Now, these mushrooms now have spread all over California, as many of you know. There's a strong association with internet companies, wood chips, and psilocybin mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder why. So, Psilocybe baeocystis is another species that's uh, hidden in the landscape. I, I have another story about that I'll pass, but... There are compounds psilocybin and psilocin. Uh, everything, the, the psilocybin degrades to psilocin. And there's serotonin, which is uh, chemically very, in a structure very, very similar. There's another compound called baocystin. Baocystin is not illegal. Um, and um, it, it also is pharmacologically active. And the, the methyl group there is easily cleaved by normal enzymes. That's a normal part. A lot of your digestive systems is cleaving off the, those, the, those methylated groups. So that's really interesting to me. So from those psychotherapists out there, I think the potential of using baocystin uh, should be also examined. Psilocybe stuncii, uh, stuncii after Daniel Stunts, uh, alenii are two other species, the Psilocybe semilanciata and Psilocybe pelliculosa. Liberty crafts grow in grasslands, you know, from Ireland down in the grasslands in Chile uh, to, of course, Western North America, et cetera. So, and here is another little... Not Throughout the temperate regions of Europe and the Pacific Northwest, one of the most interesting psilocybes to collect is one that grows near ponds in the grass. And this, this field has not had uh, cows on it for more than 10 years. So cows and sheep can help, but they're not necessary. And this is psilocybe simulanciata, the famed liberty cap. Um, it's exquisite little fruiting here. It's got a translucent striate margin. You can see the striations. They're actually the gills showing through the cap. And the cap also has a separable gelatinous pellicle. So here is one over here that we can look at. And as you tear the cap, there is a film that's clearly visible. And you can say, whoa, that's a really big one. And that film stretches and then breaks. So <clears throat> these mushrooms have purple brown spores, a separable gelatinous pellicle. And they typically have a sharp umbo or a nipple at the very, very top of the cap. And this papilla or nipple is not always in every specimen, but it's quite characteristic of the species in general. So, Psilocybe semilanciata. Many people, when they pick semilanciata, they don't realize that the stem is so long. I think it's a mutualistic species with the rhizomes of grass. Um, almost like a pseudo-mycorrhizal relationship, which means it's not obligatory, um, but it benefits from it. And the stems often are picked because there are, people don't realize that the stem length is way, way down. So be careful. Always try to get the base of the stem if you can. Okay, so a number of clinical studies have come out. Many of you know about this. Johns Hopkins was really one of the first articles that came out, um, a pioneering article uh, clinically. Uh, showing a mystical-like experiences uh, had significance 14 months post-ingestion. 
relatively high dose of psilocybin, 30 milligrams. 70% um, of the individuals uh, reported positive experiences. 30% uh, reported negative experiences. But interestingly, the people who had negative experiences, the negative experiences did not extend beyond the experience itself. The people who had positive experiences, 14 months later, talking to their family members, their associates, they still, uh, they, the family members, associates, uh, and loved ones notice a, a significant change in the personality of the individuals. Uh, and they still, in re-remembering the experience, gave them further benefit. This is the extraordinary thing. With PTSD, you re-remember, you know, your, the terrible thing that happened to you, you become re-traumatized. Well, this is the exact opposite of that. Re-remembering the positive experience of psilocybin was, it had a de demonstrable benefit. An extraordinary study, it's a survey with prisoners, 480,000 people surveyed by uh, uh, DSHS, um, and they found there was associated, now association, not causation, but it can be, uh, but those people who had a psilocybin experience were associated with 27% decrease of, uh, of larceny and theft, 22% uh, decrease odds for property crime, 18% decrease odds for, for violent crime. Um, in a group of 1,266 community members, ages 16 uh, to 70, there was this just recently came out, I think it was in 2018, yep. This is really interesting. Uh, in couples, if, if the man had tripped on psilocybin, there was a statistically significant negative correlation with, uh, with spousal abuse. Interestingly, it didn't cross-correlate with women. So... Men who tripped on mushrooms tend to be nicer to their spouses. I think that is extraordinarily interesting. Um, then, then the emotional response in depression, more articles, there are clinical studies coming out left and right, um, and a, a Compass has just been approved uh, in many countries, including the United States, um, as an emergency treatment for treatment-resistant depression. That just came out in the news last week. And a reset... Uh, therapeutic mechanism is being proposed. Uh, the opportunity with therapy, this is important, this is where therapists really come in to play because the benefits without therapy are less permanent, I guess is one way of saying it, than with therapy. When you have guided therapy with somebody who's experienced, they can help you rebuild your emotive response. I think as it assists in neurogenesis, you're repatterning, you're generating uh, new neurons, you find alternative pathways to express yourself, you know, and you build upon these through talking about them. So um, another article that came out here is 2017. And I think many of you know this. And this is a great article. <laughs> I love this article, 2018. Well, if you trip on mushrooms, you have increased nature relatedness and a decreased tendency toward authoritarian political views. <laughs> Several people have recommended I run for president, and this will be my platform, right? <laughs> <laughs> you take psilocybin? Yes. Next question. You know, I won't avoid any question. I'll, I'll wave my psychedelic flag, you know, tall and, uh, and high, so. Okay, so this is what I want your therapist to watch. Louis Schwarzberg and I are doing a movie together. We've been making, making it for 12 years called Fantastic Fungi. Louis, I acknowledge you and thank you for this clip. And thank you, Johns Hopkins Medical School, for allowing uh, us to show you this clip of two patients. And this is, this is really quite potent. Anyone who's had one of those experiences in a country where it's not legal to have them is stuck in this position where something really precious and really giving a great gift to you is not understood by the culture at large and furthermore puts you or other people or and other people at risk of prosecution. And one response to that is to get angry uh, and to want to fight that. And another response to it is to say, we just got to explain to people what's going on here. And when people understand it, then there will be accommodation and respect. I've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. My diagnosis was so bad that uh, my pro it, it was, you know, they weren't giving me any, any chance whatsoever. My diagnosis was kidney cancer, finding out that you may want to get your affairs in order. 
I first found out about the study when my oncologist gave me a pamphlet. He said, here's something that might be able to help you with the anxiety. And I was accepted into the study. The most important thing is to remember that you're always safe. And a recommendation is that whatever is coming up, that you allow it, that you don't have to like it, but you say, okay, rather than trying to run away from it. Once a volunteer is enrolled in the study, they're with us for the preparation, the psilocybin sessions, and the integration follow-ups after. I have been a guide for around 350 psilocybin sessions and then about 1,000 of the preparatory and integration meetings. All right. It's really just about experiencing what comes up as psilocybin takes effect. In the intense part of this journey, this world and things that mattered to most people, family and all that, that wasn't even what it was about. They say anything mystical can't be explained. It's something like that. It's, 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 it's a feeling of such immense power that you can't even imagine. I've never felt anything like it before. It was about being in a place of infinite space and just being there. There's an experience of positive mood, sometimes open-heartedness, love, uh, transcendence of time and space, and then finally it's thought to be ineffable. People say, I can't describe that experience. I said, okay, hold it. If I give myself over to you, can you promise me that I will be in at least as strong a shape as when I entered this room? And I felt a voice that I needed to heed. Do you think I would disrespect my own handiwork? This is the voice from on high saying, do you think I would disrespect my child? And I felt so beautiful. I felt like I have never felt before. My sense of being loved, of being worthy, of love, of being cared for, of being important to someone. One-third of individuals in the study said it's the single most spiritually significant experience of their lives. About 70% say it's the, among the five most personally meaningful experiences of their lives. And you say, well, so what, what does that mean? You know, and, and initially I thought, I wonder if, if they don't have pretty dull lives. Um, but you no, know, people would say, you know, when my firstborn came into this world, I'll, I'll never forget that. And life has never been the same since. Or my father passed away. That was deeply moving to me. I'm different now in the world. And so, you know, it's kind of like that. The most glorious part of it was that it made me feel more comfortable with, with living, you know, because, uh, you're not afraid of dying. Frankly, I'm just a laboratory scientist. And I wasn't prepared for that. From the memory of the transcendental state of consciousness, 
Many people report less anxiety, less depression, less preoccupation with pain, closer interpersonal relationships, and perhaps most impressive, they claim to have a loss of the fear of death. It recalibrates how they see death. It's been amazing hearing them talk about this idea of love. Many of them spoke about how nature itself is something like a substance called love. And having touched that, they've recalibrated it and shaped how they died to feel. Okay, so. Those two patients have died now, uh, but they greeted their death with optimism and hope and feeling oneness. And this is the big movement right now for the decriminalization of psilocybin in California and Oregon and elsewhere in the United States. And it comes down to this simple argument. You have a right to choose how you die. You want to die in fear and in anger and hopelessness and anguish and regret? Or do you want to die knowing that you're one with the universe? You're at peace. You understand the, the unanimity of, of being. That, that's a real choice. You have that choice with psilocybin. And so I think the end of death argument is the best one. We should allow this to be a personal choice for those people who want to do it. So many studies have come out for lack of time, but I'm going to jump into microdosing really quickly. Microdosing is taking a sub-threshold dose of psilocybin below that which you can feel. Um, on the psilocybin cubensis scale, I'd like an elevator ride. Uh, I'd like 10 floors to an elevator or to, or to a building. Half a gram is the first floor, five grams the hero's journey. That's the 10th floor. So you're, you're taking about a quarter to a, a tenth of a gram to a 20th of a gram, somewhere in, in there. So a tenth or twentieth of a gram of psilocybin cubensis is below the threshold of having an effect. Really interestingly, I know all sorts of straight people, believe it or not, <laughs> who would never consider tripping on psilocybin. But the concept of being them taking a microdose that could, could increase neurogenesis and fight uh, depression and senility and dementia, well, that's a whole different subject. Plus, they want to feel cool with their grandkids, right? And they're also saying, <laughs> yeah, microdosing. So anyhow, microdosing is swept Silicon Valley. I know several people who actually teach coders at the major Silicon Valley internet companies. All of you know the names of these companies. And uh, the coders feel that it is giving them greater creativity. Amazingly, Roland Griffiths just published this a few, three weeks ago. Uh, I thought they're going to go from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. Schedule 1 means that a drug has no medical use and high potential for abuse. And Roland Griffiths and his team have written an article arguing it should be moved to Schedule 4 the least restrictive drug designation there is, similar to asthma medicine. Um, so meetings have been happening with the, F with the FDA. Uh, I'm privy to some of the internal conversations. The FDA, when they were approached by a group of these scientists saying it's good for PTSD for the war, uh, war veterans, uh, the FDA interrupted them and said, no, this is good for PTSD on any level. They said they've never seen a drug so powerful with so uh, so much benefit with such uh, low potential for abuse. Now, those of you who have not tripped on these mushrooms may not understand. This is not like marijuana or alcohol where you want to get high the next day or have another beer. After you trip on these mushrooms, the next day you look at them and you go, no way. <laughs> Stay away. I'm done for a while. <laughs> they have no potential for abuse, you know. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to show you something that is a little controversial. There are some therapists here, and there are some people who have um, DEA licenses. So I'm speaking uh, to those people in particular, just so you don't get any ideas here. The uh, psilocybe cyanescens and azurescens, they, they're really different. Azurescens is huge. So I've invented blue juice. Uh, you take ice cubes, you chop up a psilocybe mushroom. It's really counterintuitive for chemical extraction because typically you want hot you know, solvents for better extraction. Nope, not in this case. It took me forever to figure this out. You take uh, ice cubes, you chop up the mushrooms, you put them in a refrigerator, and they slowly melt over four or five days. And they extract the psilocybin without the beta-glucans and all the other mushroom material. 
So then you can make ice cubes for Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> Strictly for scientific research, okay? How many people have read Michael Pollan's book? Yeah. And, um, it's a great intro book for the psychedelically naive. A lot of us veterans, you know, have some criticisms about it, but Michael's done a great job in making the bridge to a different audience of individuals who would not consider it because he has so much credibility. So I want to, I have to, I want to give, I want to close in five minutes if I can here. There's another mushroom called lion's mane. This is legal. It's a potent nerve growth stim, uh, stimulant factors that are within it. It regenerates myelin on the axons of nerves. There's been two clinical studies on this. Um, at a, a mild cognitive impairment, double-blind placebo-controlled clinical uh, study, significant increase in cognitive uh, function and tests from um, uh, consuming these mushrooms for about 25 days on an order of about four, uh, four to six grams of these mushrooms, once in the morning and once in the evening by capsules. Um, it causes a neurogenesis, and particularly it removes amyloid plaques. There's two really interesting studies with mice, where they inject mice with a toxic uh, uh, polypeptide that induces amyloid plaque formation. Amyloid plaque formation is associated uh, with Alzheimer's patients upon resection after death. Amyloid plaque can be confirmed in degeneration of myelin, and the presence of amyloid plaque uh, interferes with neurotransmission. The mice, when they were fed in full-blown Alzheimer's-like symptoms with amyloid plaque, when they were fed the lion's mane mushrooms three to four weeks later, they, it resolved. Amyloid plaque had, had, had been uh, largely removed. In demonstration of maize experiments, they then uh, were able to navigate maize to near normal conditions, where prior to that, they were confused um, and unable to navigate. So there was both uh, resection improving microscopically as well as behavior this is a really important mushroom. I, I would I ask all of you to consider taking this mushroom on a daily basis. We all want to suffer some sort of type of neurological uh, decline. Um, and this is a fact of aging. And so lion's mane mushrooms can be found in the wild. They grow here in California. And then fortunately, the price of psilocybin is $7,000 $7, per gram. So I had a dream. I came up with a stacking formula, a epigenetic neurogenic formula, stacking psilocybin, lion's mane, and vitamin B3, nicotinic acid. So those of you who are older here may remember this. I'd like to have a show of hands. How many people remember in the 70s in particular that if you're tripping on LSD or psilocybin, if you took niacin, you could come down? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people. You know, it turned out not to be true. <laughs> but it, that's the conventional wisdom. Um, but it, I'm thinking that you've got niacin flush, it excites the endpoints of your nervous system. Well, neuropathy oftentimes uh, is seen as the dieback of your nerves at your fingertips and your toes. So neuropathy is oftentimes represented that way. I thought if you stack it with niacin, you can excite the nerve endings. And we know that lion's mane regenerates myelin on the axons of nerves. And we know that psilocybin uh, causes neurogenesis at the tips why not stack these together? So this, I think, is a, I want to reinvent psilocybin as a vitamin. Taking a, a sub-threshold doses, below the levels of intoxication. The niacin also serves a purpose of, of like ant abuse. The patients will not be able to abuse it. The adverse effects of a niacin flush, if you those who have taken a lot of niacin, you're itching, you're red, people will talk to you, what's wrong with you? You know, it's a very, very negative reaction. So this is a way of stacking these together uh, for epigenetic neurogenesis, and we lose body intellect of our culture with uh, aging the aging population. We're losing Einsteins every day because of neuro, uh, uh, neurodegeneration. Uh, this is a loss to our cultural uh, our cultural knowledge, and it's so important that we give cultural we get the knowledge to the next generation to pass on. That next generation is going to become elders. So if you can stack these and increase your ability uh, to to, uh, to increase your intelligence, I think this is really important. I, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to, if anyone wants to leave the lunch, I'm going to try to stop. I have to tell you this story. It's too friggin' cool. Um, I just heard this, and uh, I was with some physicians, and this uh, chef in, um, up in Vancouver told me this three, four days ago. I said, this is crazy. This is, this is so fantastic. Now, I don't know any Canadians here may know this game and people from Germany, but he was in the Yukon or up in that area, and there's a family reunion, 150 people, big bar scene, lots of music, people drinking, smoking. He doesn't do any of that stuff. And he's sitting at our table, and it was all guys, and they have this little game. 
And they put nails on a pine board. And they have a little tiny, the nail heads are this big. But the hammer is this big. It's a bar game. They play it all over the world now. I guess in Asia they do it too. And the idea is you put money on the table and you pound the nail down. So, I mean, he's never played this before. Everybody else is pretty intoxicated. But he goes in the bathroom and someone says, hey, you want some psilocybin? I go, oh, well, I heard about it. Sure. So he takes a dose of psilocybin and waits about 20, 30 minutes. He's invited to this little game. He's now tripping. He's feeling it. I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. And he said he just got tunnel vision, just excluded all the noise. And all these macho Canadian you know, guys and all trying to outperform each other. And they're going around. It's his turn. And he looks at it, tunnel vision, takes a hammer, boom, nailed it, literally, right down. They go to put $10 around. Bam! Does it again, two times in a row. Eight times in a row, everybody at the table is freaking out. And then he said, I had to do it. I go, what? He goes, the guy that was freaking out the most, he looked at him in the, in the eyes and went, bam! <laughs> <laughs> they lost it. Well, this makes sense. This is kind of like this is an example of a case. If you are throwing a spear against a saber-toothed tiger, the increase in agility, the increase in being able to perceive, to cognitively strategize against an opponent, an adversary against climate change. You know, I think that these compounds have enormous potential for increasing intelligence, acuity, and skills. Okay, now this is important for you to know. Is the mice injected with low doses of psilocybin extinguish the, uh, the, uh, the conditioned fear response, not the high doses. High doses, no doubt, will do it. But clinically showing that the low doses had a better influence than the higher doses. This is also an, an argument for uh, having a nootropic vitamin for treating depression long term. You have to be careful about deadly gallerinas. They're poisonous. They have rusty brown spores. I have... Um, 65 videos up on Instagram. I, I call them knowledge bombs. I drop them every few days. There's a bunch up there right now that you can go to my Instagram account and see these little knowledge bombs are one minute long talking about this mushroom. So I want to just close. I have four more slides here. This is Gymnopolis luteofolius. This is getting a little esoteric. This is an extremely rare psilocybin active mushroom. It does have rusty brown spores. That's why we don't advocate people look for it. But this is so crazy. Okay, this is July 8th, uh, 2011, and it's just hard to believe that uh, Paul Stamos' boat will be growing a psychoactive mushroom, but it's true. I know it's not the best specimen right now, but this is Gymnopolis luteofolius. It is uh, unique to alder. It's a very rare species. In fact, most mycologists would not be able to identify it. I just happen to have a specialty in this area, and um, it is, uh, it's so weird because my friend Clay here, hey Clay, he said he found a mushroom going off of a boat and he brought it to me from your friend, right? Yeah, at Harstein Island boat uh, launch. And it was also Gymnopolis luteofolius. So it begs the question now, is this mushroom indigenous to Northwest boats? Uh, <laughs> and I, I've never found this in the wild. I've seen it at a mycological society, but uh, I go figure. Now, I'm not going to pick it, so I guess I'm not breaking the law. <laughs> Or am I breaking the law because it's growing here and I know what it is. I don't know what to do. Uh, anyhow, how bizarre. Gymnopolis luteofolius on Stamus's boat. And we've had more than one sighting of this on this boat and more than one boat now, two boats. So go figure. This may be why some of the European species uh, came to the United States uh, with pilgrims. Many of the ships that were brought over were then reconstructed into houses. So the mycelial footprints, you know, came across the ocean. It's very plausible. Okay, so... Weird science. This just came, just came out about two months ago. Uh, and cicadas, 17 years in the ground, they came up. They come up. I grew up in Ohio. We had cicadas, you know, I had several experiences with cicadas there. And uh, they get these fuzzy butts. Well, the fuzzy butt, it, it actually decomposes their sexual organs. Their genitalia falls off, but they can still fly. And the males then will mimic uh, female behavior to entice a male cicada to get close to it because it was just discovered that that fungus in his butt is packed full of psilocybin. Yeah, psychoactive cicadas. <laughs> and those of you who are not a kid, I saw these little fuzzy butts, but no one uh, ever decided to analyze them. 
So they have this sort of uh, mimicry of, of sex acts to entice, and the females then also do the, the, do the same and back and forth to attract so the spores will dust on the other cicadas, and then they go, they un go underground, and this fungus li lives in subterraneously. But where is this going to stop, folks? <laughs> you know? So the next cicada uh, you know, uh, outburst, there's going to be all these psychonauts out there collecting them and making teas of cicadas. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with this. So, all right, folks, um, I want to just close with this one two-minute little, little film here. Mushroom mycelium represents rebirth, rejuvenation, regeneration. Fungi generate soil that gives life. The task that we face today is to understand the language of nature. My mission is to discover the language of nature of the fungal networks that communicate with the ecosystem. And I believe nature is intelligent. The fact that we lack the language skills to communicate with nature does not impugn the concept that nature is intelligent. It speaks to our inadequacy for communication. If we don't get our act together and come in commonality and understanding with the organisms that sustain us today, not only will we destroy those organisms, but we will destroy ourselves. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? If I die trying, and but I'm inadequate to the task to make a course change in the evolution of life on this planet, okay, I tried. The fact is, I tried. How many people are not trying? If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives into the future, had you walked down this path of knowledge, wouldn't you run down that path of knowledge as fast as you could? I believe nature is a force of good. Good is not only a concept, it is a spirit. And so hopefully the spirit of goodness will survive. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you.